and happy last day of uh, Women's History Month. So am I gonna be able to um, use um, PowerPoint? Yes, uh, so when you get, when I introduce you, what you would do is just uh, share your screen and okay. then you can go through your PowerPoint. I found then, a picture, I just found a picture two days ago, uh, Ada Braddock when she's about 23 years old. Oh, wow, I can't wait to see it. Awesome. And Jerry, also, I need to talk to you. So the developer is doing the project around Lift Their Voice in Sane Park. He wants me to do six or eight heritage signs on his property. So there'd be some type of a heritage walk that's going to be extending out from that the happen uh, for you. park. So can, I'm going to get with you. So I can fill the park. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, this could be outside the park, but I, I you think know what we I can, mean. Yeah, we can, we can complement it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to declare 20 a quorum and, and start us off. Uh, welcome everybody to this second webinar of um, our Jacksonville history series. Um, this project started in conjunction with the funds engagement on Lift Every Voice and Sing Park. Um, which it just had its groundbreaking about a month ago, and we hope we'll get underway very soon. But we recognized when we were talking to a lot of people about Lift Every Voice in St. Park that there were lots of pockets of Jacksonville history that many people were not aware of. So we started, in fact, last year with a session on the Jewish history of Jacksonville, again, starting very much in La Villa. And we are following it up today with the session on the women of La Villa. And we, we have an exciting calendar uh, that we're just mapping out for the rest of the year that includes topics like the culinary history of Jacksonville, the military history of Jacksonville, the musical history of Jacksonville, and lots of other uh, fun topics that I will bet that many of you who are on this seminar don't know all the details of so and and I certainly don't know all the details of so I am very much looking forward to it and I'm now going to hand it over to Ennis Davis of the Jackson who is our co-host of, of the whole series take it away Ennis thank you Mari so good after well let's go ahead and get this started here we go. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Ennis Davis, and I'm the co-founder of the Jackson Magazine, which is a partnership between WJCT and Modern Cities. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first virtual panel discussion of the Jacksonville History and Heritage Series, which is co-produced by me and the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. The theme of this Her History and Heritage Series would be to expose our community's history and build pride within the Jacksonville story in a manner that helps future generations preserve, restore, and promote our community's unique sense of place and cultural contributions to the greater society. In honor of Women's History Month, today's event will focus on the women of La Villa. So by the 1920s, Georgia Sea Island singer, Bessie Jones called La Villa the magic city it was a desired destination upon for the former enslaved throughout the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, a unique African-American culture and community along the coastal south stretching from St. Augustine, Florida, north to Wilmington, North Carolina. Home to the largest train station south of Washington, DC, it would quickly transform Jacksonville into Florida's gateway city serving as a home for early 20th century immigrants establishing new lives for themselves and families in Jacksonville, as well as a logistics hub for travelers coming to Florida to become new residents. 
However, the story of the city's most culturally diverse historic neighborhood would not be complete or remotely possible without the significant contributions of women. For example, it was here in 1863 that Harriet Tugman, known as the Moses of her people, provided the intelligence that allowed the Union to capture Jacksonville without a shot. It was also here in 1863, traveling with the 33rd Infantry Regiment U.S. Colored Troops, that Susie King Teller, the only African-American nurse to publish a memoir of her Civil War experiences, will provide an educational foundation for the lives that live on today in Jacksonville. Incorporated as a city of its own in 1866, it was here that Helen Louise Dillette Johnson would become Florida's first African-American female teacher, paving the path for the storied careers of her sons, James Weldon and John Roseman Johnson, the writer and composer of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It was also here where madams like Cora Crane, Belle Orloff, Lida DeCamp and Maple Walker operated brothels by the names of the court, the New York Inn, Turkish Harlem, the Senate, and the Spanish Marie that created an opportunity for struggling musicians. Owner real estate and businesses in the red light district known as the line, they hire professors or musicians to entertain their guests in and around Ward Street, which is present day Houston Street. Many of those early professors and musicians would go on to become key contributors to the, during the formative years of ragtime, blues, and jazz. In fact, Ma Rainey, who was known as the mother of blues, would start her career as an employee of Patrick Henry Chappelle, a musician who owned a theater in the red light district and would later own the Rabbit's Foot Company. Capitalizing on LaVilla's energy, it was women such as Alice Kilpatrick and Euretha White who would open hotels like the Richmond and Central catering to black travelers and musicians seeking to avoid racial humiliation and danger when visiting a Jim Crow era in Jacksonville. A place many mistakenly refer to as the Harlem of the South, one could argue that Harlem is the La Villa of the North, since the Great Migration was fueled by former residents of La Villa, taking their established Southern culture and exposing it globally after moving to the North. It was also here where women such as Eartha White would become women's suffrage and civil rights leaders. Despite continuous attempts to destroy La Villa's physical and cultural sense of place over the years, their contributions continue to play a significant role in the growth and development of Jacksonville today. After years of stagnation and decline, La Villa is a community in the midst of a rebirth. However, as redevelopment takes place, it is important to not only remember but pay homage and respect to the women of La Villa and their sacrifices and contributions. With this in mind, we're honored to have you join us today as we celebrate Women's History Month with this virtual conversation about the many unsung female heroes who have shaped La Villa's history and the neighborhood and grew into a thriving business and cultural center in the 20th century. As an urban planner, historian, and co-founder of the Jackson Magazine, I'll be your moderator today. I'm delighted to be joined with today with three great panelists, Dr. T.J. Basso, Associate Professor of uh, Women's Gender and Sexual Studies at Purdue University, Jerry Urso, Grand Historian for the Most Worshipful Union Grand Lodge of Florida, and Mamie Davis, attorney and CPA and a trustee and treasurer for Historic Stanton Incorporated. Each panelist will share their reflections on women who have made an impact. Following each of their 10 minute talks, we will close this event with a Q&A session. So feel free to use the chat room or the Q&A box to post your questions and comments for the panelists to answer. So our first panelist is Dr. Tracy Jean Brawasso. I'm gonna call her TJ. So TJ holds a PD, PhD in US Women's History and has published numerous books, journals, articles, book chapters, 
and has edited volumes contributing to that field from multiple disciplinary perspectives. A major focus of her scholarship has been African-American women's autobiography. She is the author of two articles on the civil rights memoirist um, Anne Moody and two articles on civil, civil war memoirist Susie King Teller. TJ is currently working on a monograph, Women with the World at Their Feet, which spans over a century of American women's participation in and experience of world spheres. So let's welcome Dr. TJ as she provides us a bit of background on the life and contributions of Susie King Teller. Thank you, Ennis. That was very kind. I'm so happy to be here. I have learned a lot already about uh, La Via and Jacksonville in general, and I'm happy to share with you um, what I know about Susie King Taylor. Uh, if you'll, uh, I'm hoping that you all have the uh, images in front of you. Um, and this is one of the earliest photos I've ever seen of Susie King Taylor on the left and on the right, a photo taken um, right around the time when she published her memoir at age 54. Uh, and that that photo appears on the um, frontispiece of her book. Let me tell you a little bit about Susie King Taylor generally first. One of the first African Americans to emancipate themselves by joining with the Union Army during the Civil War, a participant in the first all black Union Army regiment formed to fight that war. Susie King Taylor was founder of the first school we know of openly established in the South for the recently freed persons and the only woman black or white to publish a memoir of the war experienced from within an active duty regiment. Susie Baker King Taylor stands out in every way as a national heroine and historical figure. Her legacy, especially that involving the gift of literacy shared with those who would go on to found the La Via neighborhood in the city of Jacksonville, Florida, lives on. Susie was born to Hagar and Raymond Baker on August 6, 1848, about 35 miles south of Savannah, Georgia, on the Grest Plantation located on the Isle of Wight in Liberty County, upriver from St. Catherine Sound. In the mid 1850s, while still a very young girl, Susie Baker and two of her siblings left the Gress Farm and the care of their mother and were sent on what was likely a two day journey to Savannah to live with their emancipated grandmother, Dolly Reed, who ran a boarding house in the city. For five years, just preceding the outbreak of the Civil War, Susie received instruction from free women who lived in the vicinity of her grandmother in Savannah. We should remember their names since the service they performed in teaching Susie to read and write was paid forward by her as teacher to freed people during and following the war. Mrs. Woodhouse and Mrs. Mary Beasley both risked everything, their livelihoods, possibly even their status as free persons to surreptitiously teach Susie and other black children in the neighborhood. Susie also received instruction from sympathetic white friends, including a white playmate named Katie O'Connor and James Blewis, her grandmother's white landlord's son, who attended the local high school in Savannah. They too risked censor and shunning by the white community for teaching black people like Susie, the one thing that could most jeopardize uh, the enslaved status. In the spring of 1862, as the war and Yankee soldiers moved closer, and slave owners became alarmed at the thought of losing what they thought of as their property to the Union Army. Susie and her siblings were sent out of Savannah back to their mother in the countryside. And this is an image of Fort Pulaski, where on the 1st of April, 1862, just as the shelling of this fort began, word spread that Union Major General David Hunter had declared all enslaved persons freed by the Union Army. And this is before the Emancipation Proclamation. Susie was one of those who jumped at the opportunity Hunter's declaration represented, rushing to the nearest port and successfully boarding a Union gunboat bound for the Union Army encampment on St. Simon's Island. On board ship en route to St. Simon's, young Susie Baker met fellow refugee from slavery, Edward King, whom she would later marry and whom would soon become a non-commissioned officer in Company E of the 1st South Carolina Volunteers 
later renamed the 33rd United States Colored Infantry Regiment, the first black volunteer regiment composed of freedmen formed under the authority of Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson and headed by Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Trowbridge, two prominent white un union officers sympathetic to freedmen in and in favor of the abolition of slavery. And I'll also add in favor of uh, the vote, uh, the enfranchisement of freed men as well as women, both of whom later provided endorsements and forewords for Susie Baker's published memoir of the war and its aftermath. After passing a brief literacy test, a white officer named Commodore Lewis M. Goldsboro supplied writing utensils and books and put Susie in charge of organizing a school for the freedmen and their children. This school on St. Simons Island represents the first school we know of in the South established specifically to educate the recently freed. After several months on St. Simons Island, Susie took charge of the small nursing corps accompanying the regiment on its way to Old Fort, which would be renamed Camp Saxton on the mainland. In those tumultuous six months of 1862, Susie Baker King had left her enslaved life behind her forever. She had gotten married, established a school for free persons, started a nursing corps, set out for war as part of an army regiment devoted to freeing the rest of her people and celebrated her 14th birthday. Susie spent the next three years of her teens and the Civil War traveling with and serving the 33rd Regiment as a nurse, teacher, cook, laundress, and weapons inspector. She was camped for some time in Camp Shaw, South Carolina, and helped nurse wounded soldiers at the hospital in nearby Beaufort, working closely alongside the famed Clara Barton, who later founded the American Red Cross and the modern profession of nursing, and who Susie tells us was, quote, very cordial to her cordiality being something that Susie had not come to expect from a white woman. Susie's other responsibilities in the regiment were more directly related to its military purposes. She does not tell us that she ever fired a weapon during combat, but she knew how to and how to assemble, clean, and check them for malfunctions, a far more important and dangerous job than modern guns require given how often they misfired while you were handling them. This quote is from her book. I learned to handle a musket very well while in the regiment and could shoot straight and often hit the target. I assisted in cleaning the guns and used to fire them off to see if the car cartridges were dry before cleaning and reloading each day. I thought this great fun. I was also able to take a gun all apart and put it together again. I really love this quote because we can hear the young Susie come through in her recollection a teenager who uh, was very proud of herself um, for being able to do this very important job. One of the most important periods in Susie's experience of the war was the time she spent at Camp Saxton, established in 1862, near the Smith Plantation on Port Royal Island. On January 1, 1863, and I hope a date that is um, sparks uh, excitement in all of you, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was read aloud to the men of the 1st South Carolina Infantry, along with hundreds of other formerly enslaved people gathered together in a stand of live oak trees to hear the words of a document that purported to free their people en masse and with one fell stroke. This first celebration of Emancipation Day and the resulting newspaper reports, diary accounts and recollections of it probably make this the most notable and best documented first moment of emancipation in the South. Most people who recorded that event recalled with awe the inspiring speeches and especially the decision of one freed woman to lift her voice and sing, my country tis of thee, joined by her newly freed brethren in an unforgettable spontaneous outpouring of love for freedom and country. Written down 40 years later, Susie's memory of that day was a little less reverent she took the opportunity to declare hers a discerning palette for Southern style barbecue. And I like this quote too. And um, I'll just read it really quickly. It was a glorious day for us all. We enjoyed every minute of it as a fitting close and crowning event of the occasion. We had a grand barbecue. 
And she goes on to say, although not served as tastily or correctly as it would have been at home, yet it was enjoyed with keen appetites and relish. I guess everyone in the South has their own way of understanding barbecue. In chapter five of Susie's book, she tells us she journeyed with the 33rd as far south as Jacksonville. March 10th, 1863, we were ordered to Jacksonville, Florida, leaving Camp Saxton between four and five o'clock. We arrived at Jacksonville about eight o'clock the next morning, accompanied by three or four gunboats. When the rebels saw these boats, they ran out of the city, leaving the women behind. And we found them later, she tells us, hiding behind a house about a mile or so away, their faces blackened to disguise them. One of the things I like about this quote and that you could hear in the authorial voice of Susie King Taylor is her understatement. Um, clearly, um, she's conveying her um, disgust with uh, the rebel soldiers' masculinity. After the war, Susie King Taylor uh, Susie and Edward King, sorry, returned to Savannah, where in 1866, she opened a school for recently freed people at their home on South Broad Street, now Oglethorpe Avenue. Her school initially enrolled 20 children, each paying $1 per month. But competition from free schools receiving federal funding, such as the Beach Institute, chipped away at her enrollment and finally forced her to close. Edward, though trained as a carpenter, opened his own business, hiring men to unload vessels docked in the harbor. Within a few months of settling into Savannah, Susie became pregnant, but also widowed. Her husband, Edward, died a few months before she gave birth and one year after the end of the war in September of 1866. In April of 1867, Susie, now widowed and with an infant to care for, moved back to Georgia where she opened another school. King's schools never received aid from the Freedmen's Bureau or other aid societies to support them. Susie herself never received either pay or pension for her own service to the nation through the Civil War. But in 1872, she did receive a $100 payment stemming from her husband's service, some of which she deposited in a Freedmen's Savings Bank. Unable to compete with the federally funded free schools that had opened, and like other freed women and most women of color would for another century, Susie resorted to supporting herself by taking employment as a maid, laundress, or cook in a number of wealthy white homes, some of whom she traveled with as a lady's maid. In 1874, while visiting Boston with an employer, she met Black businessman Russell L. Taylor, marrying him in 1879 at the age of 31. Settling into a second life as a middle-class woman in Boston in the, in the 1880s, Susie King, now Taylor, made the needs of Civil War veterans, especially Black veterans, central to her club woman activities. In 1886, she helped organize Corps 67, the Boston chapter of the Women's Relief Corps as an auxiliary to the Union's Veteran Association, the Grand Army of the Republic. In 1893, she was made president of the GOP auxiliary. Taylor briefly records in her memoir, one return trip to the South, to Savannah in 1888, where she went to visit her aging grandmother before she died. Her memoir lingers much longer over the details of her visit to the South 10 years later in 1898 to escort her severely ill son from Shreveport, Louisiana, north for medical treatment. Tragically, she failed in this effort, denied as she was a sleeper birth for him due to the New South's entrenched system of racial segregation on trains and her son died in New Orleans. Susie Baker King Taylor herself died at age 64 on October 6th, 1912 and was buried next to her second husband in an unmarked grave in Mount Hope Cemetery, Rosendale, Massachusetts. Did I miss something? Um, a decade prior in 1902, with Higginson's help, she published her memoir, Reminiscences of My Life in Camp with the 33rd. Her aim in sharing her life story, she tells us, stemmed in part from her desire to bring dignity and appreciation to the black and white veterans of the Union Army 
as well as recognition to the women of her race who had contributed to the war effort, many of whom were currently engaged in community activism and public works of racial uplift. Susie Baker King Taylor tells us she felt it was particularly important we keep the sacrifices she and others made and the bravery she and others showed before the public. Quote, let us not forget that terrible war, Taylor opined, or the part played in the securing of black freedom by black women in particular. She says, there are many people who do not know what some of the colored women did during the war. There were hundreds who assisted the Union soldiers by hiding them and helping them to escape. Although we knew the penalty, should we be caught giving them aid? These things should be kept in history before the people. There has never been a greater war in the United States than the one of 1861, where so many lives were lost. Not men alone, but noble women as well. And I will end there. Thank you, TJ, that was great. It's just very, um exciting to me that her contributions led to uh, many of those former uh, U.S. Uh, colored troops learning how to read and many of those troops settle and become some of the earliest settlers in the community of La Villa. So I want to move on to our second panelist, uh, Jerry Urso. Uh, Jerry is a grand historian of the most worshipful Union Grand Lodge of Florida. He's involved with a lot of things. I've always been impressed uh, from afar by Jerry, especially with the uh, Ritz exhibit uh, he did for the Masonic Lodge a couple of years ago. Uh, in addition to being the grand historian, he is the president of the Alexander H. Darns Research Chapter in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he's also a board member of the Real Rosewood and Jerry and July Perry Foundations the executive or educational director of the Most Worshipful Union Grand Lodge Foundation. He's uh, uh, also a past mass of Solly Mitchell Lodge 377 in Jacksonville and winner of the Dr. Charles Wesley Historical Award. So let's welcome uh, Jerry, and I believe he has a PowerPoint presentation for us. Good evening. Um, I'd like to let's see if Share. Okay. I'm not quite that tech savvy. I'm working on getting better. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I'd like to extend you greetings from the most worshipful Union Grand Lodge of Florida, where the Honorable Jeffrey G. Jones serves as our 19th most worshipful Grand Master. And I'd also like to acknowledge Sister Lillian L. Carter, our Grand Worthy Matron, and heroine Vernell B. Douglas, our most ancient Grand Matron, as both of these women are an extension of the philanthropy education uplifting the community as first led by the women I'm about to discuss. So on May 20th, 1865 is the Emancipation Day in Florida. It created a humanitarian crisis. The number of elderly orphans and single mothers had created a crisis that the Freedmen's Bureau was unable to solely fulfill those needs. Organizations and auxiliaries as well as the church incorporated the needs of the people into their duties. Women actually led the charge in this great humanitarian effort in La Villa, pursuing years of organizing, chartering societies, and throughout the late 19th and 20th century, such as women's clubs, the Heroines of Jericho, the Household of Ruth, International Organization of Good Templars, Order of the Eastern Star, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, to name a few, followed by the national education sororities of the early 1900s. The theme to uplift and educate used by Winona Cargill Alexander, co-founder of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority would be ingrained in her by the women that she met in La Villa that laid the groundwork of benevolence, philanthropy in a scrappy little city called La Villa. And these are their stories. And that first picture I'd like to point out, that's the heroines of Jericho and the lady holding the little boy by the hand is none other than Ada Braddock, one of the most powerful women in Jacksonville. So we'll get to her story in a minute. This is um, actually one of the programs um, for the Federation of Colored Women's Club that was held in Jacksonville, March 24th in 1913 um, by Miss Booker T. Washington and the president of the local chapter, as you see on the bottom was Miss Eartha White. The names you'll see, Winona Alexander, you'll see uh, a lot of the names I say um, will be repeated because they cross-pollinated between all these organizations. 
Mary E.C. Day Smith was an African-American educator who in 1866 came from the North to Tallahassee to become a mission worker for the AME Church. In 1880, she continued her work in Jacksonville, except for a brief interlude where she was ordained a minister. Black women in Jacksonville, as elsewhere, organized separate organizations. They had frequent contact with the National Women's Club movement. Miss Mary E.C. Smith, who had come from the North as a teacher for the Freedmen's Bureau, organizes the M.E. Smith Club in Jacksonville as part of the African-American Women's Clubs. In 1896, she was noted as the first cl um, club woman in Florida, focusing on children and charity work. So she became, as the Florida Sun would describe her, the leading woman of her race in Florida. Mary E.C. Smith served as Grand Secretary for the Heroines of Jericho. Miss Ada Braddock Bracey was one of the most prominent women in Jacksonville at the end of the 19th century. She was born to Samuel and Violet Williams, a wealthy and esteemed family. Bracey would marry the Reverend Pembroke Braddock, who was one of the early residents of La Villa and the founder of St. Paul's AME Church. The, Braddock pers the Braddocks personally financed the first brick structure building in Florida for African-Americans when they erected the second building for St. Paul's Episcopal Church. In 1882, Ada Braddock was elected the first most ancient grand matron, and she would hold that position for 18 years. She would serve on the Grand Court, making her the first woman in Florida to serve on any national body. Ada was also a member of the International Good Templars with other distinguished members, such as Bishop Abraham Grant, Principal William Matrell Middleton of Stanton High School and Joseph E. Lee, Clara English White, and she was the treasurer for the women's club for many years. Helen Louise DeBlitt, um, as well as being a music teacher and a public school teacher before attending Stanton, her fellow Bohemian um, music director, William Middleton Matrell, um, was the principal at Stanton and imparted on her a great love and knowledge of uh, English literature and the European style of music, especially chamber music. When the Johnson brothers arrived in Harlem, music in Harlem was still in its infancy and the Johnson's brothers brought a level of sophistication to the music as most of the music at that time was ragtime, jive and vaudeville. So her influence on her children actually changed the course of jazz history in America because the Johnson brothers along with Bob Cole actually really sophisticated the music of Harlem as well as she was also a member of the heroines of Jericho. And she is, you'll find her name throughout the different women's clubs and so forth. Um, and especially being the first lady at Shiloh Baptist Church, um, her influence, you cannot underestimate her, inf um, her influences on black women in La Villa during that time period. But Clara White, Clara White um, is a former slave. Both her parents had died, and she had adopted. Uh, her, then her husband had passed away, so she had adopted Eartha. And in the course of her, her struggling as a single mother raising a child, she found um, work as a maid, and then eventually uh, serving in hotels um, and doing laundry and so several other things that she was able to put her money aside to start the first um, old folks home for colored people in Jacksonville as part of that humanitarian crisis. And if it wasn't for Clara White, could you imagine the domino that wouldn't have fell that was put in, placed into the hands of Eartha White for all the great works that Eartha White had done. And one of the quotes that I especially attributed to Clara White that I always loved was, she said, do all the good you can in all the ways that you can, in all the places you can, for all the people you can, while you can. And she was also a member of the Heroines of Jericho. So Ella uh, McWilliams Chamberlain of Tampa, who in the early 1890s organized at least 100 Florida women into the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And after she moved, suffrage wasn't a movement again until about 1912, when the women in Jacksonville formed the Equal Franchise League. The organization actually excluded African-American women. And as a result, the African-American women formed the National Association of Colored Women. In 1920, Eartha White 
led the voter registration drives to, um, to register black women to vote. In an effort to intimidate black voters, the Ku Klux Klan staged a parade the day before the election of 1920, threatening voters. Nevertheless, Eartha and other activists encouraged thousands of black voters, mostly women and men, to show up at the polls. And despite the increased participation, official campaign results erased all but a few. It was estimated by Eartha White that between three to 4,000 black voters were denied their right to vote. And although their plans to present their case to the United States Congress when it came time, White told the NAACP that many officials of her complaint were afraid and refused to speak. As in Jacksonville, the height of the lynchings was really beginning. Um, and earlier that year, July Perry um, was lynched in Ocoee, Florida. And so she was actually part of a contingent that I'll get to um, that would actually force um, Congress to form the Dwyer Act. So Eartha um, and her mother began the, the Colored Old Folks Home in which Eartha White Nursing Home. Her other endeavors included Mercy Hospital, the Boys Improvement Club of Oakland Park, which was the first public park in Jacksonville for African Americans, a halfway house for alcoholics in recovery, a program for released prisoners to re-help them enter society in a comprehensive maternity program with a home for unwed mothers in an orphanage and an adoption agency. And Eartha White was a proud member of Temple Chapter Order of the Eastern Star. Inez T. Austin Boyer was the first vice president of the NAACP Women's Club under Mary Bethune. She later became the second president to serve in that capacity. She was a champion of the women's suffrage movement and also campaigned for the women's right to vote in the 1920s. She was the president of the National Council of Negro Women and the first woman to serve on the building committee for the most worshipful Union Grand Lodge of Florida from 1906 to 1912. Boya helped raise the funds for the construction of the Masonic Temple. She is on the marker for the Grand Lodge dedication in 1912. And in 1940, when the mortgage was paid off, she was the only living woman um, from the original trustee board. Um, she served as the Grand Worthy matron for 50 years. So if you go to the corner at 410 Broad Street, you will see her name on the cornerstone. Blanche May Armwood was an educator activist, opera singer, and first African-American woman in the state of Florida to graduate from accredited law school. In addition to her leadership positions in Tampa, Armwood held the position of serving national organizations, including the chair of the Home Economics Department of the National Association for Colored Women, the national campaign speaker for the Republican Party, as well as the state organizer in Florida, Louisiana chapters of the NAACP. She was a frequent speaker on national interna um, international lecture circuits, speaking about voting rights and racial inequality. Armwood participated in the suffrage and anti-lynching crusades. She worked closely with anti-lynching advocate Mary Beth um, McLeod Bethune, including help to raise funds and other resources for Bethune-Cookman College and other black schools throughout the state. She was a close friends with Clara Fry, a black nurse, who provided the first medical facilities for Blacks in Tampa. Um, Armwood raised funds for the um, for Fry and helped establish the first training program for licensed Black nurses in some of the first bl um, blood banks for African Americans in Florida. Before organizing the local chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star, she was an active member of the Heroines of Jericho, Rebecca Court, number 134. Zura Neil Hurston, um, knew how to make an entrance. On May 1st, 1925, at the Literary Awards Dinner sponsored by the Opportunity Magazine of the earthly Harlem newcomer, it turned heads and raised eyebrows as she claimed four awards. Hurston was published books more than any other African-American woman in, in American history. She was unable to capture the mainstream audiences in her lifetime and she died poor and alone in a welfare hotel. But today, she is seen as one of the most important black writers of, Af of American history. She was a member of the Bethlehem Grand Chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star. And in 1952, Hurston assigned um, to the Pittsburgh Curry to cover a small town murder of Ruby McClellan, the prosperous black wife of a local um, 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 and racketeer. 
who had killed the racist white doctor. In the later years of her life, she was a teacher in Fort Pierce, Florida. She not only received, she never received her flowers while she was alive, yet today she is the mother of the Negro expressionism, renowned anthropologist, folklorist, and journalist, and the author of tragedies, and she experienced pale in um, comparison to the legacy that she left behind. And a note from my first grandmaster, um, the Honorable Dr. Joseph Love, um, Love, where he wrote while serving here in Jacksonville, the race rise as its women rise. They are the true standard of its evolution. And that will end my portion of the program. Thank you, Jerry. I mean, that was great. Uh, it's tons of knowledge in, in history um, shown in those slides. So I want to quickly go ahead and introduce our third and final panelist of the day. Uh, her name is Mamie L. Davis. Uh, Ms. Davis is the uh, owner of Mamie L. Davis uh, PA, a professional association uh, specializing in legal and professional accounting services in areas of bankruptcy, estate planning, probate, guardianship law, and performing analytical reviews, advisory, and consultation services. She is a member of the Florida Bar and the Jacksonville Bar Association and has served as past presidents of the Jacksonville Bankruptcy Bar Association, Daniel Webster Perkins Bar Association, and the Jacksonville Chapter of the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Currently, she serves on the board of trustees of Historic Stanton Incorporated as the chair and the Estate Planning Council of Northeast Florida. Let's welcome Mamie L. Davis. Thank you very much. It is my honor um, to participate on this uh, most distinguished panel. And I'd like to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and uh, Jackson, the Jackson for inviting me to participate. Uh, I have very much enjoyed the presentations of the other two panelists. And I have to admit that they have overlapped some of what I was going to say. So I won't spend very much time on that. It's in my capacity though, as the chair of the historic Stanton um, board of directors that I'm here today. And I was asked to speak on how the women of La Villa, uh, more specifically old Stanton have influenced and inspired me. So let me tell you a little about myself. You've got my bio, but I was born in Shelman, Georgia and my family moved to Jacksonville, Florida of uh, the summer of 1965, uh, while in, I was in elementary school and moved to La Villa. So I lived on Duval Street, the address 1033 West Duval, and then we moved to 1043 West Duval Street uh, for a couple of years uh, before they moved the family to uh, the north side, um, the Grand Park area, where my father still lives. Uh, so, so coming to Jacksonville, uh, in the late 60s, I saw the, um, the excitement that was in La Villa, uh, the, the houses, the people, and, and, and La Villa is right there near downtown Jacksonville. And so, oh, Stanton, uh, I was familiar with that building. Uh, at that time, uh, starting in 1953, um, uh, uh, it was not operated as a high school. A new school had been built on 13th Street and that was called New Stanton. And the old Stanton was a vocational school. So students attended the vocational school and, and that's how we, um, we refer to it as the vocational school. And of course the New Stanton was the more exciting school for growing up. I uh, graduated from high school in 1971 and spent a lot of time downtown because I worked at the old Maycorn's department store. That's now our um, city hall. So that was my first job. Uh, I had to remember getting a work permit in order to work there, but it was pretty exciting being downtown, working in a department store and to uh, experience everything that the La Villa and downtown areas had to offer. Um, the um, Stanton School, um, as we know, just for history, was established in 1868 as the first um, public school for African-American children in Jacksonville. Uh, the school name honors Edwin M. Stanton, an abolitionist and secretary of war under President 
Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in the first year of operations, the school had six teachers and 348 students. Uh, three buildings have been on the land, uh, which is 1.5 acres located at 521 West Ashley Street downtown. And the current building was finished in 1917. And it was the only high school for African-Americans in Duval County. Uh, James Weldon Johnson was a student at Stanton uh, and served as principal from 1894 to 1902. And uh, being one of the most distinguished um, graduates of Stanton. Uh, and in selecting the persons that influenced me greatly and um, uh, as a child, but more so as the, um, as the chair of the board of Historic Stanton, uh, in honor of, of Women History Month would be Louise, uh, Helen Louise uh, Dillett Johnson, his mother. Uh, she, she has been mentioned by both uh, uh, our moderator and uh, Ms. Urso, so I won't spend more time on her, but certainly she set the tone. Um, the family moved to La Villa uh, shortly after she was married. Uh, and uh, built, uh, bought land there and later built a house. And the family lived there for 43 years. Uh, so she was La Villa. She was part of La Villa. And uh, she went on to um, uh, do so much for the community as we've been told, uh, and not the least in um, raising one of the most influential graduates, uh, James Weldon Johnson, he was an educator, lawyer, dis diplomat, newspaper editor, novelist, essayist, reformer, cultural and race leader. Uh, he um, was a student there at, 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 at Stanton and, and probably because of his mother, uh, he came back and be later became principal. And I say that because being a student, he talked about at one point, the reputation of the school was not that great. And a number of families were moving their children from that school to other schools. But at that time, his mother was a teacher at Stanton and she later became assistant principal. And she felt that uh, it would look pretty bad if she moved her son from that school. So he went on and he finished the school mainly because of his mother. So I think we need to really acknowledge her and, uh, and the, the, the groundbreaking work that she did and uh, for the La Villa area. Another on my list were um, Clara White and um, Eartha M. White. Again, I won't spend much time on them uh, because it's been covered so well, um, but uh, they um, are responsible for the Clara White mission that is still operating today. And it is right across the street from the old Stanton School. In addition to the, um, the legends that I've mentioned, uh, I wanted to um, uh, highlight two living legends trailblazers and that were graduates of O. Stanton. As I indicated earlier, the school um, stopped operating as a public school in 1953. So we're talking about uh, two legends that graduated prior to 1953. And one is Camilla Thompson. And she's very well known here in Jacksonville. She was born in 1922. Uh, she was an educator of math and science in Duval County Public School System uh, and a historian of, of African-American history in Jacksonville. So here in the city, you will see her name attached to so many different things. She wrote over 500 articles that were published by the Jacksonville Free Press. And the other living legend is Dr. Norman uh, Solomon White. Uh, she was born in 1934. Uh, she is a retired educator and was the uh, 25th international president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And this is an uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which is my sorority, uh, was established in 1908 at um, Howard University in Washington, DC. And Dr. White was the first international president from Florida. Uh, since uh, that time, there's been one other one from Tampa, but uh, we're talking a, a very large, large organization that Dr. White is very influential in and has done so much. Uh, recently, um, uh, we've heard more about this organization because Vice President Kamala Harris is a member and uh, 
and so we've heard so much more about it. Dr. White, um, Dr. Normal Solomon White was also the first female member of the Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University Marching 100 Band and the first female band director in Florida. Uh, she served 37 years as an educator with um, the Duval County Public Schools uh, as assistant principal, magnet coordinator, and uh, music supervisor. And she was the first African-American um, Eve Ward recipient here. And uh, she was that recipient for the fine arts. Um, so um, as you can see, we have legends uh, we have uh, living legends, and uh, it is my honor to be the one who gets to tell the story of historic standing at this point. And it's a story that's developing. Uh, I have been chair of the board all of what, a month and a half. So I'm looking at filling this story. And our main effort right now is to renovate the school uh, and, and to become a museum and culture center uh, for the city. Uh, we have plans and we're refining those plans and hopefully uh, in the near future, it will be something that will happen. It will happen. Uh, we're looking and again, the museum and to have retail and office space in that building. We invite uh, all that are interested to join us. Uh, we have a website at historicstanton.org uh, and um, we have a board and we are expanding at a as a board and we have two board members that actually graduated from Old Stanton. Uh, we have the Dr. Uh, Charles B. McIntosh who was born in 1926 uh, and Dr. R.L. Mitchell who was born in 1935. So we have a lot of history right there on that board. Um, but we are growing, we are expanding, we are excited about what we are doing and we just invite the community to join us. And uh, again, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to uh, participate on this panel. Okay. Back to you, Mr. Davis. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I have to miss, I have, I have to meet Mrs. White because uh, I'm also a family graduate. So I, I need to see her <laughs> March 100, and you got me right there. So yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. So we don't have that much time for questions, but I am going to ask one question of you. And I'm so glad you you were able to uh, explain the plans for uh, historic Stanton. Mm -hmm. So this is just a general question for uh, all all panelists. Uh, as we Continuing this process of redeveloping LaVille, I know you've noticed there's hundreds of apartment units have gone up recently. Um, the JTA has constructed a new center. Um, DuPont is working on Lift Their Voice the Same Park. Robert Jacks is working on uh, the LaVille Trail, which is a part of the Emerald Trail system. I guess my question would be, as these projects progress, uh, what are some ways that we can make sure we pay homage uh, to, the, to the women of La Villa uh, as these projects go forward. And that's for anybody. Well, I'll speak. Um, certainly, I think having um, um, webinars or sessions like this is, is, is great. Uh, and so much information has been, um, has been shared. And, um, and I know that it will be available for people to to um, access and listen to later on. Uh, and with um, the museum, I mean, there should, there will be uh, some of this history there too. So regular programs uh, uh, and um, sharing them as well as possible, I think will, will be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I think, oh, I'm no, sorry. Here, no, you you well, I'm just real short. It's really from my own uh, perspective, you know, in, in working in universities, is that when there are scholarships that co that come with a name and have a mission that requires the students who might apply for those or be nominated by someone else to 
um, understand that mission and connect to it, um, I think is a very good way to get word out and make that person's legacy live on and live on in a specific way that carries forth their influence and their um, desire to be influential um, to future generations. So uh, I'm sure you have uh, many of, of, of these already, but naming specific scholarships for specific women with criteria that really require people to, or kind of help people recall what that woman's uh, contribution was uh, I think is a very effective way and can go on in perpetuity if these uh, small, even small scholarships are endowed. Um, so we continue to be inspired and to know and to remember and, and also to want to um, continue in the footsteps, um, you know, the path laid forward by those, by those women. So that's something that I would suggest. I also think making sure that women get included in all these museums, that there are exhibits dedicated to these women as well as historical markers. You know, I'm big on these historical markers. And, you know, one of the things you see around Jacksonville is there's so much dedicated to the Confederacy and we need to raise funds to uplift the people from La Villa and have them memorialized. One thing the Daughters of the Confederacy never did was they were never short on raising funds to honor theirs. And one, you know, instead of, I'm not worried about what they do, I'm worried about what we do. And La Villa needs to be a living testament to its past. And honoring these women is, prob is paramount. And, you know, we get these syndrome, like the Frederick Douglass syndrome, where everything is Black History Month is about Frederick Douglass. And, and is, I'm a big fan of James Weldon Johnson, but there are so many other people in Jacksonville that we can't name everything after one person. There's just so many people we need to honor. We need to make sure that we honor those legacies. So thank you for those, all three of those answers. Those are great answers. And I know there's people on this call that are involved with uh, placemaking and various projects that will be uh, developed in La Villa in the coming years. Uh, we're right on one o'clock, so I'm going to start to close this out. But I, as mentioned earlier, uh, this event was the first, or is the first, of the Jacksonville History and Heritage Series that is co-produced by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and uh, the Jackson Magazine. Our second event will be hosted virtually on Monday, May the 24th. Uh, to expose and highlight the multicultural culinary history of Jacksonville. Uh, we'd love to have you join us again. So stay tuned for more details by following the Jackson Mag on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or through our website, thejacksonmag.com. So in closing, I do want to thank all of our panelists and our guests for taking the time to spend your lunch hour with us today and have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We all need to get together and talk. <laughs>